it off with racing from the birthplace of speed, Daytona International Speedway. The event, the final round of the Motor World Endurance Road Racing Championship. Chris Larson reports. Celebrations before race time are a bit unusual. But if you're Team Lockhart, the newly crowned series champions, it's allowed. The members of Team Lockhart entered the Daytona round as race favorite. Arch rivals, Pennsylvania's Dutchman Racing, number three, were also cast in the favorites role. But with a field of 80 teams taking the flag for the start of the 500-kilometer event, it was really anyone's ball game. For Lockhart, that game ended quickly with mechanical problems. The anxious pacing of team tuner Keith Perry told the story. Then Dutchman Racing hit hard times as a recurring shift linkage problem forced the team to spend precious time on pit road. Enter South Florida Racing, number 24. Rick Shaw had the team securely in the lead when he handed the bike over to teammate Ken Stevens at the first rider change. A few laps later, Stevens crashed. That opened the door for number 51, Team Hypercycle, to show their strength. The Anaheim, California-based team is led by Kerry Andrew, whose last trip to the Speedway garnered the Californian plenty of publicity. Andrew was the rider of the bike Freddie Spencer collided with during Daytona 200 qualifying. This time, Andrew's riding was flawless, and Team Hypercycle took command. Also in command, at least for a brief time earlier, was a pace car. The history-making usage during an emergency on-track situation proved to be a success. The final half of the race saw Hypercycle leading the way to the finish. Congratulations to Hypercycle and all the participants in the Motor World Endurance Series in 87. See you next year. Reporting for Motor World, this is Chris Larson. Motorcycles in the Daytona International Speedway have enjoyed a long and successful marriage. The annual Motorcycle Speed Week has been going on for 46 years. This week's Fram Autolite flashback, however, recalls the first time the Motor World Endurance Series paid Daytona a visit. Dave Bowman looks back at the 1985 Paul Revere 250. For 18 years, the July 4th holiday racing program at Daytona International Speedway featured sports car racing in the Paul Revere 250. Then in 1985, the format underwent a dramatic change. Well, the world watches what happens at Daytona. It's not called the World Center of Speed by accident. The France family has set new standards in every avenue of motorcycle racing and automobile racing. This is the first car-motorcycle combination of its type. And if the Speedway is pleased with it, it will be the first of many. History was in the making at Daytona on July the 3rd, 1985, as the first ever Paul Revere 250 for motorcycles was about to begin. The uniqueness of the event, which would start and finish under the lights attracted a record-setting field of 80 teams from throughout the U.S. For the riders, the 250-mile race meant learning how to run fast and safe while depending in good part on the bike's headlights to show the way. The riders' pit crews also faced some interesting problems. The main one, giving pit signals which could be seen. The finish nearly one hour into July the 4th saw the Dr. John's Team Moto Guzzi entry put their names in the record books as the inaugural race winners. It may have been after 1 a.m. in the morning when the celebration started in Winter Circle, but that didn't slow things down one bit, and the momentum gained by the Dr. John's team at Daytona carried them on to victory in the U.S. Endurance Road Race title chase. Reporting for Motor World, this is Dave Bowman. Wood entertainers and motorcycles have enjoyed a long-standing relationship. Two names that come to mind, the late Steve McQueen and comedian Jay Leno. Dennis Torres joins us now with a look at another actor that has joined that Hollywood motorcycle connection. Dennis, tell us who it is. His father is the legendary actor Anthony Quinn, and his most famous movie performance to date, the celebrated war drama Platoon. If you haven't guessed his name yet, it's Francesco Quinn. We caught up with the 24-year-old actor recently, and we found out he's serious about his motorcycles. Number two in your program, Kajiva-mounted Francesco Quinn, dueling it out with fellow racers under the California stars. The eldest son of actor Anthony Quinn has been a busy actor this year, completing two films and working on a third. Yet the experience of Platoon still lingers. See, I'd never really gone through the Vietnam War because I was living in Italy at the time. Um, and I was too young, too, so... So, uh, I used to play war games and stuff like that, and then all of a sudden I got to the uh, boot camp that Platoon made us go through, and I said, why? Why do people go to wars? What the hell is this? Madma, I want, I want to get out of this. And, and, and I couldn't, you see, I was in this. I, I signed a contract. 
Francesco Quinn was raised in Italy and came to love motorcycle racing as so many Italians do. And he has developed a relationship with the Italian motorcycle giant Kajiva. In fact, in 1988, he will join legendary tuner Rino Leone and his longtime rider Jimmy Adamo and go road racing on a professional level. Okay, with Rino Leone, we're now negotiating sponsorship um, with some big sponsors. And I formed a team with Reno, and Jimmy Adamo is one of our riders, and we're going to be riding uh, Battle of the Twins, myself also. I mean, I don't know how well I'll do, because, I mean, I can't do too well, um, because I'm not allowed, I don't have, I don't have that much time, I've got to be realistic. Practical, mature, and equipped with unlimited potential as an actor. Francesco Quinn, continuing the long legacy of Hollywood and motorcycles. Francesco Quinn will star in two motion pictures in 88. After the Rain deals with the behind-the-scenes world of rock and roll. And Stradivarius, the story of the legendary Italian violin maker, will star Francesco as well as his father in the title role. Now let's move on from the Hollywood motorcycle connection to the automobile motorcycle connection. As you're about to see, when cars and bikes take to the racetrack, they have a lot in common. Formula One Grand Prix Auto Racing, acknowledged as the pinnacle of four-wheel competition. This is the type of racing that competes through the streets of Monaco and the legendary tracks of Europe like Spa, Belgium and Monza, Italy. When you win in the F1 arena, the whole world hears about it. If you're a driver or a constructor of racing cars, this is where you win the World Championship. Grand Prix Motorcycle Road Racing is the glamour counterpart to the Formula One car scene, but it's yet to reach the level of corporate involvement or worldwide recognition enjoyed by F1 cars. But as time goes by, the two have become more and more intertwined. Case in point, the recent Mexican Grand Prix. In conjunction with the F1 cars, promoters put on three motorcycle races. This gave the two-wheel crowd a chance to strut their stuff in front of the most sophisticated motorsports fans in the world. The motorcycle racers put on a good show with exciting top-level racing and some of the thrills and spills common to our sport. In fact, the motorcycle sideshow ended up being one of the highlights of the weekend. Uh, well, they've loved it, so we're coming back and we're bringing motorcycling back to Mexico City and to the Grand Prix, which will be held in uh, May 1988. Besides sharing the bill on the racetrack, cars and bikes share some of the same sponsors. The most prominent example, Honda. The Japanese company produces cars and motorcycles and therefore feels it's important to flex its technological muscle in both areas of competition. It is rumored that Honda spends in excess of $10 million a year furnishing engines for Team Williams and Team Lotus. That's four cars competing in 16 races at a cost of over $10 million. Obviously, Honda wants to win, and they are. Honda powered Brazilian Nelson Piquet to the 1987 World Driving Championship. Meanwhile, down the pits, Honda shares sponsorship support at Team Lotus with a familiar face to American racing fans, Camel. The sponsorship activities of uh, Camel are uh, just a part of what we call our overall marketing mix, and they are an enhancement, if you will, of our uh, classic advertising campaign around the world. And we look for such things as Formula One sponsorship with Camel Team Lotus Honda to add uh, image and status as well as awareness through the media coverage of the events. The writing is on the wall in international motorsports. Cars and bikes complement each other in the eyes of corporate executives around the world. Let's hope our country can come to that same realization. American motorcycle racing desperately needs a shot in the arm, and if the folks who sponsor NASCAR, CART, and IMSA offer motorcycle racing similar support, that would be just what the doctor ordered. Those are made to be broken. Last week, the 16-year reign of Husqvarna-mounted riders in the National Championship Enduro Series came to an end. The rider who broke the string, KTM's Kevin Hines. The high desert around Southern California's Lake Lucerne Valley was the site of the Bad Mountain National Enduro, the 10th round of the 12-race series. For 26-year-old Kevin Hines, though, it was more than just another stop on the circuit. 
and I know what I have to do here. I have to win this one to actually wrap it up, and then I don't have to ride the last two events, so I plan on winning this one. But on the trail, Kevin's plan went astray. Perhaps it was the pressure of the title chase or the desire to win that caused Hines to set too fast a pace. The KTM rider arrived early at a checkpoint. That cost him valuable points. Husqvarna's Dave Bertram, the only other rider with a shot at the title, also had problems. He arrived late. The result was the same, valuable points lost. Meanwhile, Kawasaki's Larry Rossler, a highly regarded veteran of the desert, split the difference. He arrived on time and took the overall win. Hines' second overall, coupled with Bertram's fifth place finish, gave the Massachusetts native the title boost he needed. For ending a 16-year reign by Husqvarna and winning his first national enduro championship title, we're naming KTM's Kevin Hines as our Castro Rider of the Week. Hines will receive a custom embroidered racing jacket and a commemorative plaque from Castro. Officially, Hines didn't receive notification of his spot in the record books until three days later. Well, I used to ride for Husky. There's a little bit of hard feelings when I left Husky, but I went to KTM and I assumed I could beat them when I was on a different motorcycle and it turned out real good. It feels good to be in the record books for something I've done in the National Enduro Series. Putting your name in the record books is always a good feeling, but I'll tell you what, putting your name in the record books and being congratulated by the President of the United States is a fantastic feeling. Our Capitol Hill correspondent, Denny King, can attest to that. Washington, D.C., the international symbol of this country's world status and home to its politicians who govern the land. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, resident of the President of the United States. Historically, the White House has hosted world-renowned dignitaries as well as prominent national entertainment figures, like this year's World Series victors, the Minnesota Twins, and many sports legends before them. Motorcycle racers can now stand alongside the long legacy of sporting heroes. Honored by the President of the United States, if you haven't recognized them yet, the lucky two-wheel sportsmen that met Mr. Reagan were members of this year's victorious Team USA in the prestigious motocross de nations. I also uh, have a, a jacket for you that was for our team that represented us at the race this year in, in the building in York. Well, thank you very much. Team USA. You gotta recognize that that's kind of a switch for an old horse cavalry. <laughs> Well, that's great. I thank you very much. Today, President Reagan uh, congratulated these young riders for their victorious performance at the Motocross Donations in Unadilla, New York. How was it today, guys? That was a memorable moment for me, and definitely I'd, I'd talk uh, had a really good time here, and it was exciting. That's great, Jeff. And for you, Rick? Uh, some little stand out in, uh, in my memory for the rest of my life. Uh, you see him on TV all the time, and we finally get to meet him and shake his hand. Uh, couldn't have been any better. That's terrific. Bob Hanna. Oh, I loved it. Uh, I wasn't too excited when I first heard about it, but about 10 minutes before you see him, I think my hands started sweating. <laughs> we all had a little bit more moisture in the palms than usual, but none of us minded a bit. From the White House, reporting for Motor World, this is Denny King. Hurricane Hanna and the Gipper. Now that's a photograph that I would like to have in my scrapbook. This week's Coors Behind the Scenes segment looks at the first family of hill climbing. Steve Saunders reports on Canada's Williams family and their father-son approach to racing. Greg Williams is an apt pupil when his father, John, talks race strategy. The father and son aspect in racing isn't unusual, but in the sport of national championship hill climbing, the Williams family has redefined the involvement factor. This is a family affair. I've been in it for three years, and my dad's been racing for 26 years now. My brother's also racing. He started when I did three years ago and it's just a whole team effort. That team effort began paying off in 1985 when Greg clinched the 500cc class title in his final ride of the series. Determined to win the crown at nearly any cost, Williams literally flew to a triumphant victory. John, a five-time 500cc title winner himself, was well aware of the pressure on Greg. Uh, we knew what he was going through, and I'm telling you, you can learn something off these youngsters, and it's really something else. I'm, I'm so excited I can hardly talk. Usually I can blabber forever in front of a camera. The senior Williams doesn't spend all his time behind the scenes. He's also a tough competitor who plies his craft in the 750cc class. While his last title may have come in 1981, John Williams still knows his way to the top. 
And so does son Greg. The lessons learned in winning the 1985 crown carried Williams on to the 1986 and 1987 titles as well. And John Williams was right there to help him celebrate them all. Reporting for Moto World, this is Steve Saunders. A world championship event could be with a title like True Grits 50cc Road Reliability Run? Well, let's go to Two Wheels Only Campground in the North Georgia Mountains and find out. This world championship competition is truly a serious affair. How serious? Serious enough for this rider to roll out his 1956 wizard. And serious enough for this rider to show up dressed as a taco. Hey, it was so serious that event organizer Ben Cheatwood used visual aids to explain the finer points of this unique event. Then things got really serious. It was race time for the 52 entries. Everyone made it to the starting line. Now that's serious. The 100-mile course through the wilds of North Georgia provided the riders with an unexpected surprise, an earthquake. It rattled Motor World cameraman Bob Link so bad, it was hours before he stopped shaking. Some of the competitors had problems, too. This rider couldn't stop doing reverse wheelies. He thought style points were the key to winning. How many points you figure you lost? We lost about 100. <laughs> why, why in the hell did you even bother? Because <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be fun. We're well, having fun. fun. I had fun. Tell had me about it. how much fun you had. I had about as much fun as you can have with your clothes on. Inevitably, the strain of world championship competition takes its toll, even for the winners. That deserves better. That deserves much better. <laughs> we'll get you something else if you want it. You can be. I don't talk. I'm not talking about the truck. I should have beat him. <laughs> he cheated. Well, I know. That's the only reason. If he wasn't fatter than me, I'd have beat him. <laughs> and what about the losers? Well, some blame their machines for less than stellar performances. They were last seen taking part in a strange ritual. It resembled a temper tantrum and a bit of rodeo bulldogging combined. <laughs> some people like to have small weddings. Others make getting married a really big occasion. Then there are folks like ATV racer Barry Culparis and Kathy Sadler. They invited 25,000 friends to their wedding. Mark Gleckel has the story. Las Vegas, Nevada, site of the final round of the Mickey Thompson Off-Road Grand Prix. And anyone who's ever attended a Mickey Thompson race has seen plenty of ATVs and pickup trucks intertwined in a variety of positions, and this night was no different. There was a twist, however, because ATV rider Barry Kelparis and bride Kathy Sadler had chosen this night to tie the knot, so to speak, in front of 25,000 friends in Winter Circle at the Las Vegas Silver Bowl. Barry, a racer since age nine, had special riding pants and a top hat. Kathy, vice president of a commercial transportation company, wore white symbolically and footwear for the tacky dirt surface appropriately as the preacher carried off a touching ceremony while friends and family looked on. Then finally, the kiss signaling the start of a new life for Mr. and Mrs. Barry Kel Paris. Why'd they do it here? Well, we were uh, going to get married in Vegas. I figured, what the heck, why not do it at the races? Actually, it was our best man, Brian Fry's idea. And we told him, he said, why don't you do it on the track? <laughs> and so they did. Barry and Kathy took a lap to celebrate and wave to the crowd before returning to the pits to prepare for the night of racing. Barry didn't win, but all of us at Motor World would like to offer our congratulations to the Kel Parises and wish them good luck both on and off the track. In Las Vegas, Nevada, for Motor World, Mark Gleckel reporting. And like the bride said to the groom as they rode into the moonlight to begin what we hope are many years of marital bliss, honey, keep your wheels on the ground and your feet on the pegs. For all of us here at Motor World, I'm Larry Myers. See you next week. The executive producer of Motor World,